Well, if you were to come over to my house for lunch today, I would give you a tour of my house. And the reason I would give you a tour is because there are things in my house that I am kind of proud of. See, a few years ago, we, we built a home, and to help save money, we did a lot of the work ourselves with, with some help, with some assistance, but a lot of it we, we took on ourselves. So all the insulation we did, all the flooring we did, uh, all the tile work we did, all the trim we did, all the painting, and, and more. There was a lot of work that was done in the house, and so my handiwork is literally seen everywhere you go. And one of the things I'm maybe most proud about in my house, because it was kind of my own personal touches, is I was trimming out all the windows. I had a bunch of scrap wood, and so I decided to make a sliding barn door for my office. And so I used the scrap pieces of wood to kind of make a pattern, and, and I glued them together, and then you know, put, uh, used a nail gun for some things. And then once that was done, I stained it and um, varnished it and then distressed the door. And then now it's hanging in my office, and it's the sliding door for my office door. And so if I were to, to give you a tour, I would show you that too. I'd be proud of that. And, uh, and, and literally my handiwork, again, it's, it's all over. But if you were to ask me, what's the thing you're most proud of? What's the thing you're most proud of creating? On that tour, I might show you a number of things, the tile and, you know, the, the trim and the sl- even the sliding door, but I would tell you that that's not my most treasured thing. The thing I'm most proud of, of creating or helping to create would be the, not the things on the house, not anything about the house itself, but the inhabitants of the house. I, I'd say it's my children. That's what I'm most proud of creating in my life. It's my children. And, 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 and I've had multiple of them, and, and I can tell you I can't deny them either because every time we have one, they look like me and my wife. <laughs> right? They, they bear my image, my likeness. There's something about them that that, that's like me in many ways, and I can tell you, I treasure them above anything else I've ever created. They alone are, are, are the greatest. Uh, they're my masterpiece. And this morning, as we look into the Word of God together, I want you to know that the Scriptures reveal to us that God created many amazing things. In fact, we read in the beginning of Genesis all these tremendous things that God created, the, the stars and the moon and the sun and the rocks and the trees and the oceans and the valleys and the rivers, all these amazing things. However, if you were to ask what the best thing God created was, what the most valuable thing God created was, I'm willing to bet that God wouldn't say it would be any of those things. It wouldn't be actually anything that has to do with the earth itself. It would be the inhabitants of this earth. You see, the apex of God's creative work culminated in the creation of people who inhabit his creation. The psalmist, he reminds us of this. Psalm 8, he praises God and he says this, when I look at the heavens, at your heavens, the work of your fingers, God, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you're mindful of him or the son of man that you care for him? You have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. You see, the greatest of all God's handiwork by far are human beings. We are the pinnacle of his creative work, and we're of utmost value to God. I can tell you that. In fact, God can't deny us either because we were made in his image. There's something about us that bears his likeness. It's a resemblance to God. That's the way he created us. We've been created in the image of God, and as image bears, humans are bestowed with inherent dignity and responsibility and purpose. And we're going to see some of that this morning. So go ahead and open your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter 1. Very first page of your Bible, unless you got some like notes and stuff in there. Then go to the very first page of the text itself, Genesis chapter 1. And as you're turning there, I want to let you know that over the next few weeks, God is inviting us on a tour of his creative work. God is going to show us his handiwork over the next few weeks, but we're going to focus specifically on the topic of creation and the pinnacle of God's creation. We're going to focus on humanity made in the image of God. And so the purpose of this series, just so you're aware right from the outset, is that we want to learn more about God and we want to learn more about ourselves, the people who were created in his image. And so because we're going to look at something really deep and theological this morning, this topic, the image of God, I'm going to do something, I've got to admit, I'm not... Normally, some, it's not normally something I do here on Sunday morning. 
Um, and I don't know how comfortable I am. I've been kind of wrestling with this all week, whether I should do this or not. Normally on Sunday morning, I, I describe my preaching this way. I try to keep the cookies in the bottom shelf. Why? Because everybody can reach the bottom shelf, right? Uh, but today I'm going to put the cookies a couple shelves higher. And so it's going to be a little deeper than normal, I would say. But uh, that's okay, because first of all, I watched you all as you walked in. You all look like very sharp people. Like, this is no problem for you. That's number one. Uh, and secondly, I think it's important because if we really go a little deep today with some of the theology behind this, and we're going to talk about some things that are very intriguing uh, that I'm, I'm convinced of, and, and maybe it's very new for you. But as we go deep, I feel like it's going to help set the foundation for the rest of the series. So is it okay if we spend half the morning in the deep end of the pool? Is that all right? You all, you all ready for this journey with me? Okay, great. All right. It's kind of semi-unenthusiastic. <laughs> uh, let me just skip this sermon and make up some stuff real quick. Hold on. No, uh, we're going to do this. We can do it together. And so I'm going to lay the groundwork. What I'm going to do for the first half of the message is I'm going to talk about some of this theology behind the image of God, what it means. And we're going to spend uh, the first half of the message uh, focusing on that. And then the end, we're going to kind of talk about the practical and application aspect of things. And so in the first half, I want to answer one big question. And in the second half of the message, I want to briefly answer two questions. So here's the first question this morning. What does the image of God mean? What does the image of God mean? mean? Well, by way of introduction, let me just start by mentioning the fact that when people talk about creation and man created in the image of God, they're focusing on a doctrine. Uh, So it's a a series of theological viewpoints, a doctrine uh, that many people would like to refer to as the imago Dei. Scholars and theologians will call it the imago Dei. That's simply Latin way of saying image of God. And so this is what we're studying. We're going to look at the imago Dei, the image of God today. And as you're studying this topic, there are a few different ways you can study theology. So the first approach you can do is you can take the whole Bible and you can kind of take a wide angle lens and go, you know, 3,000 feet above and look over the whole course of scripture, which we do believe was written by different authors and and, and, in different time periods, but it's all God breathed. And so there's interconnectivity there. So you can take a wide lens view of the entire Bible, and you can do something called systematic theology. Now, what systematic theology means is that you're going to take one topic, and you're going to draw from various points in the scriptures, and you're going to learn from that, and you're going to have certain uh, viewpoints that you're going to develop from this big, wide-angle view. And so if you do that in the Bible, we realize that being made in the image of God means there's something about God that, that for us, we resemble him. We reflect God in many ways various aspects of our nature and character that are like God, just like my children are like me. I can't deny them. They do things. They look like me. They, there's all sorts of things that, that remind them of me. In fact, when they do things that are wrong and, and they're things that I know I do wrong sometimes, it's hard for me to punish them because I'm like, yeah, it's my fault. I gave you that, right? And so that's, my, my children resemble me. Well, the same way, we reflect God in many ways. So for example, we're rational beings like God. We're thinking beings. We're also creative beings like God. God is a creative God. We see this in Genesis 1, and we're creative as well. We're moral beings. We're relational. We we work with with others, and and we're spiritual, just like God. In fact, if I was going to compile a list, it would go on probably uh, beyond my ability to even think of things just for a really long time because there's so many ways that we reflect God. This is the first way I would say and mention and describe what it means to be made in the image of God. That's taking a systematic theological approach to saying this is what it means. But there's another way also to develop your theology of the Bible and to be a good student of the Bible. You can often focus on a wide-angle lens and take the whole scripture and pick different things and develop your theology from that. Or you can take a more narrow-focused approach and you can take a certain text or a certain book and practice what's called biblical theology. Now, biblical theology is a little different than systematic theology. This is where you'll focus in on one section and you'll say, okay, what is this telling me within its historic context, within its historical context, because God had progressive revelation as as the books of the Bible were being written, more and more was revealed. And so if you just camp out in that section and that time and develop your theology, often that's what's called biblical theology, and you draw out things that you normally wouldn't if you use the wide-angle lens. Am I making sense? Does it sound like I'm speaking a different language? You tracking with me? All right. And so if we do biblical theology this morning, we're going to focus on something that's very unique about what it means to be made in the image of God today, and we're going to see it from Genesis chapter 1. 
and hopefully you've already turned there. Now, Genesis chapter 1, man, this is an interesting chapter of the Bible. Lots of stuff going on here. All of us probably have some familiarity with Genesis chapter 1. And so to bring some clarity this morning, I want to make two suggestions. This is my suggestions about maybe some approaches you could take for how to study the Bible. Okay, and I'm going to apply them to Genesis this morning. So if you're open to suggestion, let's start here. I want to give a disclaimer before we do our biblical theology together. Uh, Number one, let Genesis speak for itself. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean by this is we all have different presuppositions and thoughts and ideas and viewpoints and worldviews that we often, as we read through the Genesis narrative, we try to kind of project into the text. Instead of simply reading what Genesis says to us, we often insert our own ideas into this amazing book. So, for example, if you're someone who likes the idea of creation and you're really an advocate for young earth creationism, you will often read through with the lens of saying, hey, I want to see young earth creation. Or if there's someone who's an old earth creationist, you're trying to look at that text and you're trying to put in old earth creationism. Or for people who believe in evolution, they're trying to say or see certain things in the text. Or people who really are fearful of evolution and distance themselves, they're trying to use this as a proof text. Or maybe you're someone who really likes to talk about dinosaurs, so you're looking for dinosaurs in Genesis 1. Or maybe you're somebody who, who is, thinks about the Big Bang Theory or the Gap Theory. All these things, these ideas we put into Genesis 1, instead of reading what it says to us, we take our thoughts and we impose them on the text. Now let me just say, the text should inform our thinking. These are not bad things or sinful things to think about. Thinking through the age of the earth and all these things, these are rational, good thoughts that Christians should have. These are discussions we should have. But we shouldn't just take our thoughts and read them into the text. Let's take the text and read out of it and see what it tells us first. Because I got to tell you, if you're imposing things in the text, let me just tell you, stop, stop, stop doing that. Don't impose things on the biblical text. Just let Genesis speak for itself. Allow it to inform your views Uh, One of my first Bible professors who's now passed away, but a guy who's tremendously helpful to me in my life, he always would tell his students, myself, he would say, don't read into Scripture, read out of Scripture. Don't read into the text, read out of the text. This is what we want to do. So let me just say this morning, the book of Genesis, it's not a book about biology, and it's not a book about geology. It's a book about theology. This is the intent. It's the study of God. And so in Genesis 1, we're not necessarily trying to answer all the specific questions about how God created the the world in a scientific manner. We're learning why the world was made, why the earth was made, and we're learning something about the nature and character of God and something about ourselves. This is the primary emphasis of Genesis. And so my first suggestion here is we're going to study the Bible together is let's let Genesis just speak for itself. That's number one. Secondly, one more suggestion Remember that Genesis was written for you, but not to you. Now, the whole Bible, I want you to know, because it's God-breathed and authoritative, the whole Bible is for our benefit and instruction. I believe that thoroughly. The whole Bible is for you, and it's for me. But the whole Bible wasn't written to you. You see, the way that inspiration works is God moved along holy men of God who were carried along, and they wrote, but they wrote in a certain language and a style and a context to a certain culture and people group. They had audiences. And so people like Paul, he wrote letters to a specific church, to a group of people who actually lived and breathed at a certain time. And so even though we can take these letters and all the sections of the Bible and we can say, yeah, this is a, something I can apply to my life. This is for me. It wasn't to me. And so Genesis was not written to you, it's written for you. You see, the book of Genesis, which is attributed to Moses, it would have been written thousands of years ago to people who were living in the ancient Near East. And so to understand what's happening in this book, one of the best things we can do is we can try to leave our world behind as best as we can, and we can try to think of this book from the perspective of ancient eyes, from the perspective of the original audience. And so We're going to take a journey together. And are you guys ready for this? I know this is like, you're like, all right, Pastor Joe, this is weird. You don't normally do this, but we're going to take a journey together. So maybe you can even close your eyes. Uh, But if you're going to fall asleep, because this is a nerdy message, don't close your eyes, all right? Keep them open if you're going to fall asleep. If it's helpful, though, you can keep your eyes closed. So let's take a journey together. We're going to think in the mind of an ancient person, and then we're going to talk about the book of Genesis. So imagine you and I, we live... Three and a half thousand years ago, we live in Mesopotamia and we're somewhere in the Fertile Crescent. 
But this is where early civilizations are often documented, and we have tons of, of things from this. And so we live in that region three and a half thousand years ago, and uh, we don't know much about the world because we really don't travel very far from home. Uh, there are no planes or trains or cars anywhere. We don't have television or the internet. Electricity is not going to be something that we're going to be able to harness and utilize for, for people for another three and a half thousand years, basically. And so in our village, uh, the primary way we survive, we work together, is by growing crops and raising livestock. Unfortunately for us in our village, last year was really hard on us. Because last year, it didn't rain very well, and we, we had a dry season, and so because of that, the crops didn't come in so well, and the livestock didn't do, do so well, and so we didn't have a whole lot of food. There's very little reserve, and this year coming up, we're really dependent on the harvest. We really need a good harvest, because if we don't get a good harvest, some of us are not going to make it. And so, because of that, because we desperately need rain... And because our understanding of the world around us is limited, we, which we have maybe a pantheistic background, which means we believe in many gods, and our religious worldview is, is something that is pagan, which means it's not like the God of the Bible. We have a view of many different kinds of gods. Maybe perhaps we start asking ourselves questions about the gods. Maybe perhaps we ask ourselves questions like this. Are the gods mad at us? Is that why it hadn't rained last year? Maybe the question we ask is, is the God of rain gone? Is he not listening to us? Is he mad at us? Does he not like us? Did he leave us? Where did he go? What if he's gone? This is a common way of thinking in the ancient Near East. And so, in an effort to try to curry the favor of the gods and to try to bring the rain, maybe some of us men would gather together in the center of the city and we would start making bricks out of mud and using stone and we would make and construct something. For a couple months, a couple weeks, we would construct a temple. And once we were done constructing that temple, which most people think of temples as primarily a place where you go and worship, in the ancient world, often that wasn't the main emphasis of a temple. A temple was a place where the gods would dwell on earth. It was a dwelling place. And so in, an order, in order to try to find a way to have a dominion, a, a little kingdom, a sanctuary for the rain god to come down and bless our village, we would build this temple and after we'd complete the temple, we'd begin to fill the temple with all kinds of religious items and all these different things. And finally, what we would do in this temple is we would carve for ourselves an image, an image of what we think the rain god looks like. Maybe it's out of wood or out of stone. And we would take this image and we would place it in the center of the temple. And there, once everything was completed, what would often happen in the ancient world is they would take a day for inauguration. It's actually a day of rest, they would often call it, where they would allow the, temple to, or allow the idol to sit inside the temple and they would offer up prayers and incantations to the rain god, asking, begging, in fact, the rain god to come down and inhabit that idol and exercise authority through that idol so that way that idol could begin to work in their village and bring rain that they so desperately needed to survive. This was a very common way of thinking in the ancient Near East. It sounds weird, right? You're kind of like, Pastor Joe, this is kind of a cult. I'm a little nervous. This is weird. What are you talking about? But this was a common way that people thought back then. They'd build temples. They'd carve an idol. They'd place it in the temple. They'd have a day of rest and hope that that God would inhabit that idol and exercise rule and authority in that region. That was common. And so imagine we did that three and a half thousand years ago. We did all that stuff, and then all of a sudden one day a stranger comes rolling up. He's on a camel. He's a stranger from the land of Israel. And this stranger comes into our village, and, and he says, hey, what you building over there, guys? Or what was that you just built? What, what, what's that over there? And we say, well, let's explain it. You know, we have some rain problems, and so we, you know, we believe the rain God needs to bless us since we built this temple, and we put the idol in there, and then, you know, we had a day of rest, and we're hoping now that the rain is going to be good this year. And he says, oh, that's really interesting that you believe that. And he pulls out a scroll written by somebody named Moses from his area. And, and this guy was in, in the region, maybe he was trading spices or something, I'm making up a story, I don't really know. But either way, he's, he's there, and he says, oh, interesting, I don't believe that. Actually, we believe something a little different. You see, he, he begins now to read out of this scroll, and the story he reads is, is similar in many ways. It makes sense to the ancient person, but it's different. You see, the story he reads is about one God, one true big God over everything. 
And this God is constructing for himself a temple, a dwelling place, a residence for him to carry out his divine work. And in the middle of this temple, he doesn't place a statue out of wood or stone. He places many image bearers out of flesh and blood. They are the ones that are going to carry out God's purposes and work on the earth. This is the story of Genesis 1 from the mindset of an ancient Near Eastern person. And so I'm going to read through the story, and I'm just going to explain just a few things. So we're going to do a little reading out of the passage. If you turn to Genesis 1, we can read through this together. I'm going to begin by reading the first 13 verses, and then we'll just briefly talk, and we'll go through the next section, briefly talk, and then we'll kind of wrap it up. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning on the first day. And God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so, and God called the expanse heaven. And there was evening and there was morning on the second day. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together in one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees bearing fruit uh, uh, with their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth was brought, brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit which, uh, in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening and there was morning on the third day. All right, let's pause for a second. What's happening here? We're seeing the construction of this dwelling place, aren't we? We're seeing God's handiwork on display, and this is something that should be marveled over as we read this. Man, it's amazing what God is doing. But what's interesting about this is in the beginning, God is actually creating these spaces, these domains, kingdoms, maybe you could even say. And there are different ones in the first three days. On the first day, he makes a domain with light and darkness, and day and night. This is maybe the kingdom of time, the kingdom of light. On the second day, there's an expanse of the waters, and, and so we see the, the kingdom of the sky, the heavens, the sky. And then we see also God separating dry land from the water, and there's the kingdom of the, of the seas and the, the kingdom of dry land. These are different kingdoms, the kingdom of earth on that third day. And so in the first three days, there are three different spaces that are made, but there are no inhabitants of those spaces, are there? God hasn't talked about a sun or a moon yet, but there's light and darkness and day and night, but there's no sun and moon. These are domains he's created, but there's no inhabitants yet. Now over the next three days, these different domains will be inhabited by, by various things that fill and rule those domains. This is significant for us. So now let's keep reading the text for a second and see what happens in the next three days. Verse 14. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years and let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And notice this. And God made two great lights, the greater light, which is the sun, to rule the day and the lesser light, the moon, to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. Notice this. To rule, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening and there was morning on the fourth day. Then God said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures. Let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created great sea creatures, and every living creature that moves, with which the waters swarm according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, be fruitful and multiply, fill the waters and the seas. This is the very same language that we're going to see later on in Genesis. And let the birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, there was morning on the fifth day. And then now the sixth day. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds. Livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And the livestock according to their kinds. And everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. So now as God begins to fill these domains with inhabitants, we see that each kingdom is inhabited with creatures or, or things that rule and fill it. But you see, on the sixth day, God isn't done yet. There are animals we see, but, but they're, the, they're not the ones who rule over the earth. They're not the ones who are supposed to 
to exercise dominion over the earth. There's something that happens on the sixth day now which is very unique, something very special. God has been working on the house, but there are still some inhabitants for the house that he hasn't mentioned. Notice now as we pick up, this is the key section, verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea dominion, notice this, the ruling, over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Did you notice what happened there? Beginning with verse 26, God has this divine counsel. He says, let us, this is a very special point in creation. Let us make man in our image. He makes a decree that he's going to make mankind, they will inhabit the earth, but they will be in his image. Unlike anything else he's created, these are image bearers. Just as the ancient world will build a temple and then place an idol in there, an image of that God, and hope that that Idol would begin to exercise authority in the village. Here, God has created a temple, a sanctuary, a domain, a dwelling place, the earth. And he's created image bearers, us, commissioned to carry out his marching orders across the earth so that the divine purposes of God and ultimately the glory of God might be made known across the face of the earth and God might be honored as Lord for all eternity. This is the story of Genesis chapter 1. God is creating a sanctuary, a temple, a place where not only he could dwell, but a place where we could dwell with him and reign as his ambassador for the kingdom. A place where we could expand God's territory until all the earth is subject to the king. This is what we see. In fact, if you continue reading, I can go all day talking about some of this nerdy stuff, but if you read chapters 2 and 3, you see the language is very temple language. In fact, when Adam and Eve are told to work and to keep the garden, the Hebrew words that are used there are only used elsewhere in the temple and tabernacle for the priesthood who are to work and to keep in the temple and tabernacle. This is what Genesis 1 is about. I know you're bummed this morning, but there aren't dinosaurs in here. You can be a rational person and think through that, and we can take the text and inform that thinking, but I didn't read about any dinosaurs as I read through. I'm not saying they're not there. I'm just saying it's not in the text. So let's read out of the text, inform our viewpoints, not take our viewpoints and put them in the text. No dinosaurs there. But if you read chapter 2, this is also what's interesting about this temple language. Notice how the seventh day, what happens on the seventh day? It's a day of rest. Is God tired? He did a lot of work there. No, he spoke and it created everything. God is not tired. The sanctuary, the temple, it's complete. It's a day of rest. It's dedication day. It's the opportunity for humanity to begin now as God's ambassadors to to prepare for the work that God has commissioned for them to do after that. That's what this is about. And so as we ask ourselves the big question, what does the image of God mean? It means this, a couple things, but it means, yes, we're meant to reflect God and be like God in many ways. This is what we get, especially when we study systematic theology, but also very foundationally in Genesis chapter 1, as we look at biblical theology, being made in the image of God means that we represent God on earth. We are his ambassadors. We're rulers in his place that carry out his bidding. He is the true ruler and the true king. We just rule underneath him, and we do God's bidding which means we have kingdom responsibility and kingdom authority to carry out God's work on the earth. We have marching orders. God has set us apart. He didn't choose squirrels or dogs or cats to do his primary bidding. They weren't made in his image. We're different. In fact, the other day, I just, just popped in my head, but we, I was fixing... Um, I was fixing my, I have a fire pit in the backyard, and over the winter, you know, it just happens sometimes, it's a newer, it's not fully established, and so the bricks and stuff, they kind of fell into the fire pit, and so I was redigging out some sections, so I was lifting up the bricks, and each brick I lifted up, there was like a thousand ants, like on top of the pile of dirt there, and my kids were there, and they're like, ooh, gross, and there's like, you know, little ant eggs and all that stuff like that, and I was like, yep, 
yeah, that's what they do. They know they go under stuff. And so I'm moving these bricks. And then I had to start digging out the section and re kind of establishing where the bricks were going to go. And so I had to like put the shovel into those areas of dirt where all the ants were and I had to step on it. And my daughter was like, no, don't do that, dad. Don't do that to the ants. You know, they, they have feelings and they're important. And I'm like, yeah, not really, honey. Like, <laughs> like, you know, you have the wrong dad. I'm a pastor of a, like a, a Bible church, right? I'm, I'm not Buddhist, okay? So I don't think this thing has a soul. I don't think this thing is very, I mean, I mean, I'm not going to intentionally like brutalize these ants because I'm some sort of psychopath or anything, but like I got work to do. So the ant is going to be subject to my dominion and authority, which is God gave me in the garden. I'm exercising rule over this ant. That's what I'm doing. So we had a deep conversation and I talked about the temple and no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but this is what I believe. This is in the text. He didn't pick cats, dogs, squirrels, ants to do his bidding. He chose humans. We've been set apart, endowed with the very image of our creator, and commissioned with the divine task of ruling and filling this planet, of advancing the glory of God across the face of the earth as the waters cover the sea. This is what it means to be made in the image of God. And so now that we've spent a lot of time in the deep end of the pool, you're all probably ready to get up and, and catch your breath for a minute or wake up, whatever you've got to do. And now it's time to get practical. You see, we've answered our first question. What does the image of God mean? And now the next question I want to answer is this. Why does the image of God matter? We always want to preach a so what to who cares. Why does this matter? Why the theology lesson? Well, first of all, the image of God matters because it means that your life has purpose. Your life has purpose. I, I know I've talked to so many people as a pastor who say, you know, I just don't know what my purpose in life is. I just don't know what to do, you know, and maybe it's a career thing you're wrestling with or I don't know if I'm going to get married or all these different things. And, and the question, what's my purpose in life that often comes up, I can tell you the answer is found here. It's in the word of God. It's rooted in your very identity as an image bearer of God. In fact, if you come back next week, we're going to really hone in on what this purpose means for us as image bearers. What are we to do? What are we to do with the fact that we're created in God's image? What does God expect of us? That's what we're going to talk about next week. But in Ephesians 2.10, it says this. This is interesting language, right? We are God's handiwork. We're God's handiwork. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So God's image matters because it gives us purpose. But not only that, the image of God also matters because it means that every single person on earth who's ever been born, every single person on earth who is a human, we have inherent value. As image bearers, we have dignity, we have worth, we are important. In fact, of all God's creative work, notice how much time and attention in Genesis 1 is devoted to humans. And what God is doing, it's amazing. As much as we can marvel at all the stuff that God did with the house, right? And the stars and the sun and the moon and the rivers and the rocks and the valleys and the oceans and, and everything God created, you know, the sliding barn door, we could marvel at all that stuff. But what's most important for God are the inhabitants of that house, the inhabitants of that temple, the inhabitants of the earth. We are the ones that are precious in God's sight. And so practically speaking, that means that we need to see the value in others as well. We need God's eyes. When we look at other people, we need to see them in the image of God. You know how easy it is to be a Christian and to do that Christian thing where you act really spiritual and religious and you talk about how great God is and then you see somebody doing something wrong and you trash them? The church is, is, is guilty of that sometimes, aren't we? Religious people like to do that. And thankfully, Jonathan talks about this all, all this time. We, we're not trying to be religious here. That's not our goal. It's so easy to, to, to talk about how great God is and how, how much you want to honor God with your life and then you dishonor those who he created who were made in his image. When you bless God's name and then you curse God's people. That's so common as the church sometimes and we ought not to do this. The author of James, he tells us this. In fact, he uses language of image to remind us. He says, no human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. This is the same language used there, in the image and likeness of God. 
From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be done so. You see, the image of God matters because it reminds us that people matter, which leads to my very last question this morning. Now that we know what the image of God means and now that we know why the image of God matters, my last question this morning is this. Where is the image of God manifested? Where do we see the image of God on display in the world? You may think this is just a really simple answer, right? It'd be really easy to just say, well, everywhere. You know, I believe that every person has the image of God. That's a really easy thing to say. When you make that big blanket statement and focus on humanity as a whole, that's very easy to say. However, let's not take the easy route this morning. Let me ask you, are there people in this world that you struggle seeing in the image of God? Let's raise the stakes. Are there people in this room that you struggle seeing in the image of God? You don't think they're worth much. You can't stand them. You don't like them. There's no value to that person. Look what they do. Look how they act. Who do you struggle to value? It's easy to say everyone's made in the image of God, so let's get specific this morning. You bear God's image, okay. The person you're sitting next to bears God's image. You can probably handle that. How about your neighbor who doesn't mow his lawn? drives you nuts. He's made in God's image. How about slow drivers? They're made in God's image too. Your boss is also made in God's image. Your mother-in-law, she's made in the image of God as well. Let's raise the stakes a little more. Let's get controversial. Democrats are made in God's image. I said it. Oh, snap. And so are Republicans, for some of you out there as well. (laughs) Gay people are made in the image of God. Criminals bear God's image. People of different colors and cultures and languages all bear God's image. Listen to me this morning. Humanity has been made in the image of God, and therefore each and every person is endowed by their creator with significance and value and dignity. Don't forget to see the image of God in other people. It's of utmost importance. In fact, when we begin to pull out the image of God in people, when we begin to dehumanize others and look at them in the wrong way, it gets real dangerous. You want to know why slavery was such an epidemic across the world? Because people dehumanized others. Oh, they're not fully human. They don't really matter. They're not valuable. Do you want to know what began to uproot slavery, the the Atlantic slave trade and all that stuff? It was this idea, William Wilberforce in England, he was talking about the image of God. This is what he taught. It It was this doctrine. I think Martin Luther King Jr., they just a book that was just written about him called Martin Luther King Jr. and the Image of God. You know, that was one of those doctrines that he continually preached and taught and proclaimed in this country when he fought against you know, the, the civil rights issues. It was the image of God that he kept reminding people about. How about today? Where do we dehumanize people t- today? Abortion. Oh, they're not fully human. They're not made in the image of God. Well, well they're, not, you know, they're not born yet, so that doesn't matter. Well, what does Psalm 139 say? Surely you've knit me together from my mother's womb. I'm fearfully and wonderfully created. It's dangerous when we begin to dehumanize people and don't see the image of God in them. And so as I close the message this morning, I just want to remind you with the big idea this morning. You know, some people say, oh, respect is earned. I'm not going to give them respect, you know, only if they earn it. That's not true. Respect isn't earned. This is the big idea. It's inherited from God. I'm not saying you've got to agree with every single thing a person does or all their viewpoint or their practice, like you can actually see what someone does and say, I reject that. That's not okay. You don't have to respect what people do or some of the ways they act. That's fine. But they deserve a certain level of dignity and respect as humans in the image of God. Don't forget who they are. They are precious to God. They are beautiful to God. They're of utmost importance to God. They're made in his image. Of all the things that God could say, hey, I I love and I value in my house, 
The things he's most valuing are the inhabitants of this house, the inhabitants of this temple. This is who he loves. In fact, he loves them so much, he sent his son, born of a woman who took on human flesh. He's called the perfect image, the image of the invisible God, he's called in scriptures, and he came and bled and died for those who were far from him and who were those who, who were worthy of, of, of maybe being disrespected and dishonored because of how they acted. Jesus died for people like that. Jesus died for me. One of the chief of sinners, like Paul says. And we are precious as humans in God's sight. And so for the rest of the series, as we tour God's handiwork, we must remember, it's so important, we must remember the image bearers who are most precious in God's sight. People are special. People are important to God. They matter to him. And my hope and prayer is that they matter to us as well. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this morning and for your word. We have spent a lot of the morning swimming in the deep end of the pool, talking about things that maybe even people don't agree with or haven't heard about, and that's okay. But Father, I pray that we wouldn't miss the point here, and the point is true. You value humans who've been endowed with your image. We have purpose we have value, we have dignity, and Father, we have a mission. You have commissioned your people to carry out marching orders across the face of the earth. In fact, the church has marching, marching orders. We are to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And so, Father, I thank you that this truth that we have from your word, this is something that's a reminder for us about what the image of God means, why the image of God matters, and where the image of God is manifested. It's across all of creation. And Father, because you value those made in your image, I pray that we would value them as well. I pray that we would respect them as well, that we would see other people the way that you see them made in your image, and that would transform and change the way that we interact with others. And so, Father, as the church, I pray that we wouldn't just hear your word and move on with our day, but that we'd respond to your word and apply it to our life, and that, Father, through uh, the ministry of your Holy Spirit, who's at work within our members right now, I pray that you would transform us and change us Father, from one degree of glory to the next and to the image of your Son and change us for your glory. And so we give this time to you in the precious name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.